In a previous video, I spoke a little about whether Neanderthals had religion and how they were the first hominids on our evolutionary line to ritualistically bury their dead. Now in this video, I thought we'll leave death alone for a bit and be a bit more positive and talk about life. The day-to-day -day life of a Neanderthal and the methods that they developed in order to accomplish that primary need that all creatures have in common, the need to stay alive. Now the first thing to get straight is we didn't actually evolve from Neanderthals. What happened was you had Homo erectus, who was the first uh, hominid that spread around much of the world. And the Homo erectus in Europe evolved into Neanderthals, and the Homo erectus in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, evolved into us, modern humans. So we're actually sort of uh, cousins. Just in case anyone hadn't noticed, our cousins, who evolved between 300 and 100,000 years ago, are now extinct. At least, I think they are extinct. I could have sworn one sat next to me on the bus the other day. In fact, I'm sure that every time I get the bloody bus, a Neanderthal tends to sit next to me. So perhaps there are a few of them left and they're just in hiding, posing as bus passengers. Now, that's a rubbish little joke I'm making. However, I made it not just to have you rolling on the floor in hysterical laughter, as I'm sure you all currently are doing, but also to make a point. You see, Neanderthals have got a pretty bad public image problem. The modern, stereotypical view is of the stupid, violent caveman who looks like a shaved gorilla with that shambling gait and whose daily life consists of hitting lots of animals and other cavemen and women on the heads with big clubs and dragging them off to either eat or shag or maybe even both. Finally going off to a dark, cold cave, lying down on some rocks, falling asleep to then wake up and do the whole thing all over again. This is far from the truth and says more about the ignorance of the Neanderthals Victorian discoverers than it does about the Neanderthals themselves. The fact is that Neanderthals had most of the capabilities that we do today and if you did have one, dressed up in human clothing, perhaps with a baseball cap on his head, masquerading on a bus, at a glance, you would be hard pressed to discover him. So where did this image come from? I hear you cry. Well, the short answer is that there was this Victorian dude called, and bear with me because I can never pronounce his name, Johann Karl Fulrot, or Fukrot. Probably not Fukrot. Fukrot. We'll, uh, we'll go with Fulrot. So, he was the guy who found the first full Neanderthal skeleton. And um, he rebuilt it, giving it this stereotypical image that we know so well. However, firstly, this was the skeleton of a very old Neanderthal that was riddled with arthritis. And secondly... Fulrot seems like the typical misogynistic, arrogant Victorian male who looked on anything coming before his own time as primitive and animalistic. All right then, now that that's out of the way, what is the truth? Let's for a bit use our imaginations and put ourselves in a Neanderthal's shoes. The first thing to note is that you probably didn't have any shoes because you're a Neanderthal, and there weren't any shoe shops. Let's start with what you would have looked like. Well, you would have been short, with a very stocky build, thick arms and legs, and a barrel chest. Compared to us modern humans, you would have been much stronger and more resilient. Facially, your most distinctive features would have been your large protruding forehead with thick brow ridge and a big flat nose with large nostrils. This was in order to protect your eyes from the cold 
and allow you to take more air into your lungs in order to help your body regulate its core temperature. You were living in Europe much of the time during an ice age, or just after an ice age, so you had to deal with some pretty cold conditions. What's interesting is that you had a very large brain. In fact, it was a little bit larger than our own brains. However, while a large brain is pretty characteristic of high intelligence, it isn't the only factor, and you probably, being realistic, weren't as clever as we are. Though certainly, by no means were you stupid, and you were incredibly well adapted to your lifestyle. So what was your lifestyle like? I hear you ask. Well, unfortunately, it's a pretty grim one, deprived of many of the comforts that we find essential. You have to imagine that death is a constantly reoccurring figure in your life. You are constantly in mortal peril from neighbouring tribes of Neanderthals, large predators and the elements. You don't have any of the creature comforts that we're used to, and what's more, you have no understanding of the science behind the natural world that surrounds you. The climate that you live in is one of extreme cold that is incredibly taxing on the body, and you and many of your Neanderthal chums were probably racked with pain with no source of effective pain medications. Your life is tough. You will die young, Life expectancy was probably around the age of 25, and while you did bury your dead and had a possible spiritual identity, as I was talking about in my last video, there is no evidence that you took comfort and consolation from a belief in a happy afterlife with lots of lovely angels and fluffy white clouds. You had one main aim during your day, and that was to survive till the next day, at all costs. Now before we get to doom and gloom, let's talk about what you could do in order to aid you in achieving this goal. Let's be positive. Like many of your hominid predecessors, you had the skill of flint napping. This is working flint with stones in order to create tools such as knives, axes and spear points. While your ancestors had been doing this for hundreds of thousands of years, your species took it to a whole new level of sophistication that allowed you to create incredibly intricate and effective stone tools and weapons. This allowed you to kill and butcher big game more effectively than any human before. You also fish and hunt small game with incredibly hard to make sharp stone pointed weapons that would be worked to a width of a few millimetres. Now I hate to break this to you, but I've got to be honest, there is substantial evidence that you occasionally engaged in cannibalism. Neanderthal bones have been found that show signs of having been worked with the stone tools of other Neanderthals. Whether for ritualistic purposes or out of sheer hunger and desperation, we will probably never know. Back to positive. Your home was a cave, but not because you're a stupid caveman, because it's a sensible place to live. It protected you from the elements and provided a communal area for your tribe to socially bond. Rather than it being a cold, bleak place, it would have contained a roaring fire with animal skins on the ground and art on the walls. It sounds pretty homely to me. Just picture yourself sat chatting round the fire, perhaps showing off to an attractive young girl about how brave you were in the last big hunt, with the smell of delicious roasting meat filling the home. That's right, slowly, over time, you have done something never done before. You have learnt how to control fire. You use this new tool for a variety of different purposes. It keeps you warm during the long cold nights, it scares away the predators, it helps sharpen and strengthen your tools, 
and perhaps most importantly, and probably most enjoyably, you use it to cook your food. Perhaps it was even your great-great-grandfather who first realised that when he placed his meat in the flames, it smelled fantastic and it tasted even better. What he wouldn't have realised is that that succulent juicy steak was also better for your body than raw meat. Now, you would have lived in a group that could have been up to a hundred individuals strong, including, I'm sure, quite a few of those attractive young girls. Your group looks after each other, and it helps to a certain extent the weak or sick members. We know this because in the Smithsonian Museum, there's a 40,000-year-old skeleton with evidence of a huge skull injury that would have made it incapable of survival without help from outside. The skeleton shows that it survived for many, many years after the injury. Therefore, it must have been helped by others. This empathy probably comes because being physically strong may for the first time no longer be the key factor in the group's success. Why let him die if he's a great chef, or childminder, or maybe even a great storyteller? The walls of your cave were covered in art. We have found many examples of Neanderthal art, which is a huge turning point in human history, for it shows that you didn't just have a brain that ran on instinct, but also had a mind of your own, capable of reason, individual thoughts and ideas, and aesthetic leanings. A mind is also capable of forming language, and of complex emotions, and higher social interactions and manipulations. The period where you seem to acquire a mind is believed to be between 60 and 20,000 years ago, and is given the label the Artistic Revolution. So why did this happen, I hear you ask? To put it simply, you now have the time for it. Earlier human species were locked in a constant fight for survival, that life revolved completely around the acts necessary for survival. Hunting, shagging, eating. For you, however, while life is still incredibly hard, there is some slight leeway. You have evolved such clever survival techniques that there is enough time in the day now for developing art, language and culture. You have the time to sit back for a bit, relax and use your imagination. When it comes to that chat you were having around the fire, you were quite possibly the first species to develop a proper language, probably around 40,000 years BC. Before this time, language probably consisted of single words, grunts and gestures, you should feel very proud of yourself, as many modern humans in our modern day society still revert to talking like this. This means that you can share thoughts and ideas with your fellow Neanderthals, record events through oral history, and even communally fantasise through storytelling, perhaps express tender and heartfelt emotions to that lovely young girl. On a more practical side of things, language was a huge boon on your hunting trips, allowing you to communicate strategies to your fellow hunters. Going back for a minute to those artistic achievements, the most spectacular examples are found in cave art in the Chevalier Caves in southern France, with the oldest examples dating from around 30,000 BC. The most common images are that of wild animals such as bison and aurochs, deer and horses. There are also some examples of your fellow humans, the most famous being tracings of the human hand. Maybe you and your girl trace each other's hands in a symbolic gesture of your blossoming love. There is a famous and extremely powerful quote by the great artist Pablo Picasso after he visited Altamira in Spain to see the cave paintings there. It goes as follows. After Altamira, all is decadence. End quote. He had come to the conclusion that whilst art had become more complex over the tens of thousands of years, 
when it came to the emotional, cultural and aesthetic values of art, what makes art, art, humankind had learnt nothing since the time of these cave paintings. Finally, let's talk about that hunt that you've just been showing off about. You were hunting, unfortunately, in a very tough time, the last ice age. You would have hunted a variety of different animals, some of them far larger and more powerful than yourself, such as bison and woolly mammoths. You would have had great knowledge and expertise in the creatures that you hunted, studying their seasonal patterns, such as migratory paths, in order to predict their movements. One advantage of the cold weather is that you would have basically had a giant refrigerator all around you, being able to preserve meat for long periods of time buried in the snow. The beasts would have been used for their meat, but you would have also made warm clothing from animal hides and constructed shelters from animals such as mammoth bones. You would have traded food and weapons with other tribes from possibly as far as 200 miles away. The obsidian market was sky high at the time, a highly prized material used for making weapons before metals were invented. Are you tired of being in the middle of skinning a horse carcass whilst cooking a meal for a young attractive girl when your flint knife breaks on you? Issues like this could break a relationship. Well, fear no longer. What you need is all new obsidian. It's far sharper than flint, stronger than flint, and more beautiful, coming with a glossy black satin finish. Try today, and if not completely satisfied, just trek the 200 miles back to our office, and we will give you your money back. Terms and conditions apply, such as money not existing yet. In conclusion, what is it that makes us different from every other species that exists on our crazy planet? Well, not very much, really. Our brains are pretty darn big compared to the old chimpanzee, but our core psychological makeup is the same. Our core needs and desires the same too. We do after all share 96% of our DNA with a chimp. The major difference between us is that we have developed a culture. We've built complex social interactions. We communicate through a complex language system and we have minds that aren't limited to the desires for food and sex, although they are pretty darn good. In many ways, these aspects flourished into their own at the start of our time as Homo sapiens, but we were not the only ones. They too hold true for our intelligent and creative caveman cousins, the Neanderthals. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more, then please give us a like and subscribe. Bye for now.